Hello, everyone. Let's dive in. If you're just joining us, welcome to Winter Wild, presented by Boston Harbor Islands National State Park. If you're here from an earlier session, welcome back. I'm Rebecca Smerling, Director of Programs at Boston Harbor Now. A quick reminder that you can enable closed captioning by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Now for our last presentation before we take a lunch break. Getting Outside in Winter, an REI how-to guide. We'll learn the basics of winter clothing, proper layering, and essential gear to have winter adventures in the great outdoors. Your moderator, Andrew McCaughey, is an instructor for REI local experiences in Southern New England. For the past three years, he has taught programs covering kayaking, stand-up paddleboarding, navigation, hiking, and of course, wilderness survival throughout Massachusetts and Rhode Island. When Andrew is not outdoors for, our, for REI, he can be found honing his skills on his personal adventures or hosting amazing trivia events, both live and virtual. If you'd like to join him sometime, a link is in the chat. We encourage you that during this session, you send your questions throughout the presentation. You can type your questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Now, Andrew, hi, you can take it away. Welcome. Hello. All right, so hi, as Rebecca said, my name is Andrew McCahey. I work for REI. And I've been doing that for a number of years now. Before that, I was with a couple other companies as well. But I really like to get outside in the winter because, quite frankly, I get bored being cooped up in the house all the time. Today has been a, bit, a little bit of a challenge so far. Looking outside, it's uh, a little bit bleak as of right now. But I'm sure in a little while, I'm going to have to uh, pony up and get out there and start clearing everything off. Um, feel free to send your questions. Feel free. That's a good question right there. How come I'm not outside this year? Last year, I was outside. I had built a fire in my backyard. This year, I figured the 30 to 40 mile an hour sustained winds might be a little bit of a challenge for the audio, even for someone as loud as I am. Uh, what I really want to cover in this panel is, uh, is dressing appropriately for the weather. Um, you know, the biggest dangers we look at this time of year our cold weather injuries and the big the big cold weather injuries we have to prevent are frost nip, frostbite, and hypothermia. Now, frost nip is when the skin doesn't actually freeze, but there is a little bit of cold weather damage. Usually what happens is the skin starts to hurt a little bit, it becomes red, blotchy, and then can fade to a pale, almost waxy coloring. After that, we start getting into frostbite where skin tissues and other bodily tissues actually start to freeze. These are very, very severe injuries and dressing appropriately can help prevent that. I'm gonna start with the probably the most important that gets overlooked a lot in my experience leading our outdoor trips. This is the one that I've run into with the most frequency and that's feet. A lot of people end up showing up to our classes wearing what they think will be appropriate footwear, namely, uh, things like hiking or work boots, and then thick cotton socks worn underneath. The insulation value of cotton goes down very quickly once it gets wet. Uh, what can happen is the cotton actually absorbs about 27 times its own weight in water, which makes it an amazing beach towel. Uh, I've yet to find a material that is yet to rival it, but it makes it a pretty lousy insulator when it's wet. And it clings that moisture right up against your skin. So what's happening there is twofold. One, you have contact with a very cold surface. You're not getting ins any insulation and you can actually start having heat sucked out of your body through what we call conductive heat loss. That's when your body is in contact with something that's very, very cold. The way we prevent this in the feet, layering. All of this is gonna be layering, but with the feet, we start with something very simple. These are wool sock liners. These are essentially very thin, lightweight wool socks that are designed to be worn in between other layers. So this is our base layer. This is our base layer for our foot, merino wool. It's pretty inexpensive. These are usually only nine or 10 bucks and they add a world of insulation uh, to your foot layering strategy. 
the nice thing with those is they can actually wick moisture away from your feet. So your feet aren't going to be constantly in contact with damp socks. If you have, you know, your feet in a condition where it's above freezing, but there's a lot of moisture up against the skin that can actually lead to trench foot, which uh, has a lot of similarities with frostbite in terms of the tissue damage that can be caused. After we move past the base layer socks, we have a few more options. Now I've got a couple right here. Now the next step up from cotton sock is the hand weave. I'm gonna go over some brands in a minute, um, but these are actually, I'll, I'll go over brands as we go. So these are actually, and I, I know, I'm sorry, every now and again, I do plug the company I work for. These are, these are REI brand. And I've got, I think three pairs of these. These are the newest ones. They've held up really, really well. Um, pretty inexpensive, uh, made in America, which is really nice. And they hold up nicely. These, uh, these were made in North Providence by my brother's girlfriend as Christmas gift two years ago. These are the hand woven wool socks. These are really nice. They're a little bit tougher to clean though. They are very festive, which is nice. She did a good job with them. Those are great uh, if I'm only going out for a little while. They're not the warmest socks that I own um, and they're a little less durable for something like a hike. For durable socks, more of a hiking sock, this is something more in line with uh, what you're looking at. These are uh, a lighter weight, uh, hiking sock. These are mostly merino wool. These are from Farm to Feet, which is a really nice brand that I really like. Other brands include uh, Smart Wool, which a lot of you are, I'm sure, familiar with. There's also Darn Tough, uh, a number of others. There's a couple of companies in Vermont churning out really, really nice products. I was asked recently um, by a young couple that I know through Trivia, did they really need to get good hiking socks for a trip they were taking? Or was it just, you know, a sales pitch trying to get people to buy $26 socks? As Lieutenant Dan said in Forrest Gump, you got to take care of your feet. Socks are critical. That's why I started this presentation talking about footwear and talking about socks. They are enormously important. For frostbite, it's one of the most common areas of the bodies to be affected. Feet, then hands, earlobes, nose, and right here on your face. Those are the areas that get affected by frostbite most frequently. Feet are very important. In my experience, I have seen a lot of people show up to our classes, uh, either winter navigation, winter survival, cross-country skiing, snowshoeing, all of those. They've shown up, as I said, wearing what they thought was appropriate. And as an instructor, I now carry at least two extra pairs of socks with me. And I have lent them out already numerous times so far this season. Um, I have had people have very uh, introductory stages of cold weather injuries that I've noticed, you know, they've showed me their feet and their feet start getting that, that pale, waxy complexion to them. And that's the early stages of frost and nip. Um, and if that was left untreated, that could have developed into frostbite, which is a very, very dangerous, very dangerous condition. That's why, like I said, I carry a lot of socks. These are some of the warmest ones I own. As you can see, they're very fuzzy. These hiking socks don't have that. They're just single layer merino. Very nice, very comfortable. I usually wear them if I'm gonna be very active outside. Uh, I'll wear these if it's gonna be really cold and not gonna be moving as much. I run very warm and I don't wanna overdress. I wanna have the option, which is why I carry extras with me. When I carry stuff for either my own personal use or for use in a class, I'll pack them in plastic bags. So this is stuff I just had in my work bag uh, that I grabbed for this. This is, you know, extra hat. In the hat are extra gloves, just in case. And then I always have at least two extra pairs of socks in my work bag, just like these. 
because that way, if I need them, great. If somebody else needs them, great. I have a washer and dryer, so I'm not too worried about uh, other people's you know, feet in my socks, as it were. Those are pretty much relegated specifically for emergency use only at this point anyway. It's nice to keep them in a plastic bag like that just in case it rains or they get wet in the snow, anything like that. You wanna keep that stuff dry. That's really important. Does anybody have any questions on socks before I move on to other forms of footwear? Not really. So you want to, so the question is, wouldn't the very thick socks be hard to fit in shoes that are fitted uh, normally? I have not found that to be the case. So with winter footwear, you don't want it too tight. So this is not the time to lace the boots on as tight as you can absolutely get them. Because if you do that, you're actually gonna reduce circulation in that area. You want a little bit of loose fit. That way the blood can flow unobstructed through into your feet. Um, these actually, so the thickest part of it is really up here in the ankle. And then down here in the foot is actually a little bit more snug. So you can see it a little bit here. They're, they're very, very fuzzy. But you can see it compresses a little bit after use. And up here is where it stays very, very thick. Does anybody else? Yeah, we have a couple other questions, um, Andrew. We have a question about insulated boots. What's your take on insulated boots? So I own hiking boots, uninsulated hiking boots that I use for most of my classwork because those are the boots I'm gonna be most active in. Usually what I do is adjust my sock layering uh, case dependent for the weather. I don't own a pair of insulated boots, but as I mentioned earlier, I run very warm. So I usually only wear very cold weather boots for if it's extremely cold, if I'm doing say a mountain, if I'm mountaineering, I have specific mountaineering boots, or if it's gonna be extremely cold, I might be moving a little bit more slowly. I'm gonna wear pack boots, which I'll show, I'll show you what those are in a minute. If you run cool, um, then yeah, insulated boots are great. You know, the, usually it's between like two and 600 uh, weight insulation in the boots. They're nice, they really are. Uh, I, I have enough footwear to cover my needs that I haven't picked up a pair yet, but I, I think they are overall a good idea, especially if you're going to be spending a lot of time in the cold and you run a little cooler. If you run hot, uh, it becomes more of a question. And then we have one other question about someone who's allergic to wool and your okay. thoughts on the alpaca. Oh, alpaca is fantastic. I mean, as you can see by my dramatic facial expression, when we talk about alpacas, alpacas, their, their wool is absolutely wonderful. And you don't have to limit your options to just wool. There are a number of synthetic options that are also wonderful. Um, I'm gonna tell you the big problem with synthetic is that it gets a little bit funky. Uh, when plastic materials get exposed to sweat, they start to smell like stinky plastic and that's not ideal. It's better to smell a little bit bad than be very, very cold though, or if you're allergic to all wool products, uh, then to just avoid going out in the winter altogether. So alpaca is fantastic. I know the socks are usually a little bit more expensive, um, but their quality that I've seen is, is excellent. I would own a pair of alpaca socks if I could get a uh, employee discount on alpaca socks. I'll put it to you that way. All right. Great. Yeah, we can move, move along. Thanks. Smart will uses synthetics in their socks. I don't know if they have any purely synthetic models, but most sock uh, manufacturers will tell you the composition of their socks. And it's always a good idea to look at that because you want to make sure nobody's trying to sneak 2% of cotton into a sock blend because that could be pretty bad. In terms of winter specific footwear, you can wear your hiking boots. And if you wear your hiking boots, there are options to keep snow out of them, because I know from personal experience how annoying snow inside of your boots can be. And so a company called Outdoor Research is probably the most popular for these. These are uh, gaiters. 
these literally just go around the foot uh, and the boot and they tighten up to the leg so you get coverage to keep snow out of your boots, usually to just below the knee. Now they come in a couple of different varieties, either treated nylon or Gore-Tex. The Gore-Tex are a little more expensive. They're a little warmer, which is sometimes a good thing, sometimes not a good thing, depending again on your activity level and how warm you are. Yes, avoid any cotton. Uh, don't do not wear cotton, especially in socks or base layers, which I'll talk about in a little minute. A little bit. Uh, for other uses, we've got the pack boot. This is what most people will think of when they think of winter boots. The big benefit to these guys is this. The removable liner is very important because this allows it to dry much, much, much more quickly. These are cheapos that I got years and years ago when they were on sale at job lot, I'll be honest. Not all of the stuff I own is very fancy. Uh, so, uh, Sorrel makes really, really good boots and they do have uh, removable liners, but a lot of companies do now. Um, this is a huge part of your installation. This removable liner is excellent because like I said, a lot of people think a lightweight hiking boot is going to be warm enough for a work boot. This is a rubber and leather boot that's gonna keep you pretty warm. The rubber obviously doesn't breathe. So having that removable liner is gonna be very nice when you come in from the snow that you can dry it. A brief thing about hiking boots that you should be aware of when you're thinking about wearing them in the snow in the winter. Keep in mind, a lot of them are designed now to be very breathable. So they'll have permeable synthetic membranes on the side to allow moisture to escape. This is wonderful in warm weather. Now, if you're hiking the Grand Canyon in September, they're great. However, for cold weather usage, they do not provide much insulation. If they're letting moisture out, they're letting air and heat out as well. So a full grain leather boot, uh, by that I mean solid pieces of leather, those are gonna keep you a lot warmer, a lot more protected. Um, in terms of traction, because you know, a lot of times we run into problems, more than just insulation worries, we run into traction issues. You know, how many people have fallen trying to shovel their walkway when they hit a little patch of ice? There are layered items that you can use for this. Now, the baseline is something like a yak tracks, where it's just pieces of metal or very, very small spikes that are designed to give you a little bit of extra traction on black ice on your walkways. Then we start getting into things like micro spikes. Those are bigger. It's usually about a quarter inch piece of, uh, of steel or aluminum that is designed to bite into ice. These attach to your boots um, through rubber brackets that literally just slip on over the boots. They're very convenient. They're priced very affordable for most people. They're usually between 40 and $70 or so. If you're going to be doing any serious hiking, in the winter, I urge you under no uncertain circumstances to look more deeply into traction devices to see what you might need. If you're gonna do things like Mount Wachusett, Mount Monadnock, you're gonna be fine with micro spikes. If you're starting to think that you'd like to do a Mount Washington Alpine ascent, that's a little bit more of a, a mountaineering trip. And that's when you're starting to look at crampons. Crampons are, either steel or aluminum. They are very, very long uh, spikes that go on your feet. And those are usually designed in a number of different ways. You can either attach them to non-mountaineering boots using nylon strapping, or you can attach them to mountaineering boots. In that case, you need to be sure to get the specific uh, attachment style. So with the mountaineering boots, they actually have a tongue at the front of the boot that allows the crampon to bite down in it. For 95% of people, you're going to be perfectly fine with micro spikes. They are wonderful. A lot of our mountains here, uh, I'm leading a hike on Mount Wachusett tomorrow. A lot of our mountains, especially in Southern and Central New England, ice is our big concern. It isn't deep powdery snow, it's, it's ice. Uh, and micro spikes are gonna be your best bet. 
to keep yourself upright. Does anybody have any more questions about footwear or traction devices? The brand for driveway ice would be something like Yak Tracks. So that's Y A K. Uh, those are, I believe, the originator of this idea. And those, those are going to have a number of good options for things like driveways. Because you don't want to step out into your driveway wearing crampons. That would be excessive and might confuse your neighbors. Uh, yak tracks are a really good bet. Usually what they have is uh, almost a coiled spring that goes around a... Uh, that goes around the bracket. So that actually gives you a lot of traction without being too spiky. Uh, the nano spikes from Catula are very small, small spikes that give you a little bit extra by two. And those are much cheaper than micro spikes. Uh, they are usually in the 30-ish dollar range. Snowshoes are a different item entirely. For our purposes, we don't have a lot of call to use them in Southern New England. We don't get enough of that really deep powder. We see that need up in Northern New England a lot more frequently. Uh, the brands to take a look at would be MSR or Tubbs. They have a number of advantages over the old school snowshoes. So the old school snowshoes were steamed wood. That would be between four and six feet long with essentially a mesh net almost like a wicker chair uh, designed to help you float on top of the snow. They're great for deep powder, but I can tell you from experience, they are awful for traction. You end up in more of a toboggan than a snowshoe when you have those on a hill. Modern snowshoes are much shorter. They do not offer the same amount of float as the old school ones, but what they do offer is robust traction. So the feet where the area where your foot comes into contact with snowshoe articulates and there are spikes very similar to a crampon uh, usually a textured aluminum and a lot of snowshoes will also have ridges running along the perimeter that adds even more traction in addition to that they are exemplary for keeping you stable on ice and loose icy snow like I said, the float's not as good. You can actually get uh, expansions to add a little bit of extra float to the back. I haven't used those. I just haven't had call to uh, because I don't do a lot of snowshoeing up north in fresh snow. So I'm gonna move on to base layers. So base layers are very similar to the sock liners that I showed you before. Generally, we're gonna be talking about things that are merino wool or synthetic. Uh, if you have a wool allergy, there are a number of purely synthetic options. I very neatly put all of my clothes right next to me. It looks a little silly. And forgive me, most of my clothes, especially wool and synthetics that have a great deal of static electricity, are covered in my dog's fur. There's not a lot I can do about that. I, I have tried a number of ways over the years. This is a synthetic base layer. So this is 100% polypropylene. And this is from Dualfold. It's a pretty known company. They've been around a long time. They make pretty good stuff. This top that I've had, I think I've had this for at least 12 years. I've had this for a very long time. Like I said, the tricky thing with these is they can get a little smelly. This one actually is pretty well made. It doesn't have uh, as bad of an issue with that as some of the other things that I've had over the years. Synthetic is gonna be cheaper than Merino, which is really nice. You can get a full set of long underwear base layers for usually around $50 if you shop around. And that's really good. And that'll last you for a long time because you don't always need it. One thing I will say in terms of care of a lot of this stuff, if you're machine washing it, it's fine. Wash it on the delicate cycle, cold water, and then hang it to dry. Don't throw it in your dryer. You don't want things to shrink. You don't want them to wear out. You're probably spending a good amount of money on this stuff. I mean, the socks alone usually are $20 or so a pair. You want them to last forever. Easy way to make them last a little bit longer, keep them safe from marauding dogs who like to chew on your socks. I've lost a number of pairs that way. Definitely didn't swear. 
uh, and also be sure to treat them well when you're putting them in the wash. Wool light is great. It'll keep it going, keep the elasticity nice. And I know you weren't signing on for a laundry discussion, but this stuff is expensive and you want it to last. So synthetic base layers, tremendous. Another option, wool base layers. This is a merino wool base layer. Um, these are from Fjall Raven, which is a really good company, but they are a lot more expensive. REI has uh, their own brand. Silk base layers aren't really used that much anymore. Um, so silk is a little bit more delicate and the insulative value is not as high as synthetics and wools. You can still use them. Uh, they make silk sock liners, silk blend sock liners that are pretty nice. It's just a lot less common now. Um, one issue with silk is when it gets wet, it does lose a little bit of its insulated value compared to wool and synthetics. So remember when I said cotton absorbs 27 times its own weight in water. Uh, merino wool usually only absorbs about 15% of its weight at most and then dries very quickly. Synthetic usually absorbs no water whatsoever. So it actually just transfers it very, very rapidly. Uh, other, like I was saying, other brands of merino include smart wool. They have a, a very robust line of base layers, uh, both tops and bottoms, and icebreaker as well. So with those base layers, those are going to be right up against your skin. Uh, that's going to be the immediate start of your layering process. And you can use, uh, like I said, merino or synthetic. They're your two big ones. Try and avoid cotton. And then you've got tops, bottoms, sock liners, but you can also use glove liners, which we'll talk about in a minute when I get to uh, hands specifically as a section. I'm trying to keep everything straight in my head. From base layers, you go into secondary layers. The structure of those is pretty similar. Uh, before I move on to mid layers, does anybody have any question on base layers? All right, cool. And if you get, uh, obviously, if you guys have any questions, bounce them over to Rebecca. We'll have plenty of time at the end of this that we can talk more about uh, any questions you might have, because I wanna make sure you guys are comfortable and safe when you go out and play outside. Looking at it right now, inside is not the worst option, but I, I'm probably gonna walk my dog later in this storm just to keep my neighbors on their toes. I like to keep them confused. From our base layer, we get into those mid layers. Something like this, this is a 250 weight uh, quarter zip pullover from Icebreaker. Those are great, that's a, a Merino one. And then synthetic quarter zips are also fantastic. I like quarter zips because I have a very big head and a lot of hair. So it helps to get things on and off very comfortably because I'm gonna be adjusting this layering as I progress through my day. You know, when I start out, I'm probably gonna be a little bit cool. So if I'm preparing to go for a hike, I'd rather start out a little bit cool than comfortably warm. Because if I start out warm, I'm gonna get boiling hot in about 10 minutes at any kind of exertion. So what I do is I start cool and it's easy to put things on. I can layer up very easily rather than taking stuff off, stopping and taking stuff off. Layering on the legs is a little challenging. Uh, because taking your boots on and off in deep snow is very uncomfortable. Uh, generally, what I do is go with a lighter base layer and then hiking pants. And I can use gaiters to keep uh, the snow out from my boots. And that keeps me warm enough. There are mid layers for your legs. These, for instance, are fleece mid layers. So I can wear these over my base layers and then under a shell pant or a hiking pant. And these are exactly what you expect them to be. These are literally just polar fleece and their pants. They're very simple. Uh, I've had these for uh, probably close to 20 years. Most of my stuff from Eastern Mountain Sports, I figure all came around the time they closed their store at the Emerald Square Mall in, I think, 2003. Mid-layers help out a lot. They're going to end up being a big part of your insulation, trying to keep heat in. Um, this helps mitigate the, uh, the risk of what we call radiation heat loss. That's our body emitting heat into a cooler environment. Uh, we wanna keep that heat 
So ourselves, we're very greedy when it comes to heat. So we wanna keep these layers on to keep that heat inside. Uh, another option for mid layers is actually what I'm wearing right now. This is just a wool shirt um, from Pendleton. And uh, these are very warm and rugged as well. I like these a lot because you know, it makes me look like a woodsman, I feel. Anybody have any questions on? Yeah, we just have a quick question about um, how the base layer and mid layer should fit. Like, are, are in terms of probably in terms of tight, um, tightness, but or should they be loose, Perfect. tight? Perfect. So the the base layer is going to be a little bit tighter. Now we don't necessarily want you know, like a skin 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 tight fit. Um, when it comes to dressing for winter, generally what we're doing is dressing in warmer, looser layers. Uh, the reason for this, I kind of touched on when we we're talking about footwear, is that we don't want to constrict anything too much. So the idea of wearing very, very tight form-fitting clothing over other layers of very, very tight form-fitting clothing is going to end up constricting blood vessels. Now with a base layer, having, gotcha, for the issue with, uh, for the issue with uh, you know, constriction, if we're wearing nothing but skin tight clothing and we're layering on top of that, we're gonna constrict our blood vessels too much. And that's gonna uh, amplify our risk for cold weather injuries, especially frostbite. So what's happening in that area is that we wanna have good healthy blood flow to our extremities and to our skin. When we start creating problems for that blood flow, that's when we start to magnify that risk of frostbite. So you could be very, very warm in your core, but if you're uh, wearing very, very tight clothing at your extremities, you could really run the hazard of actually having localized frostbite, even though you're warm otherwise. So warmer, looser layers are gonna be ideal. Um, those mid layers, for instance, fit me pretty loosely. Uh, as do my overlayers like jackets and shells. Any other questions? I think you're good to go. Keep going. All right, cool. Thanks, Andrew. No worries. So after those mid layers, we start getting into things like uh, puffy jackets. These are, we just call them you know, puffs for the most part. These are gonna come in two flavors, either synthetic, which is what I have here, or down. Synthetic has an advantage over down in that when it gets wet, it maintains its insulative value. Down, when it gets wet, down feathers look a lot like this when they're nice and dry. They fan out, they hold on heat really, really well because the thing that adds to insulation is actually air. You want a lot of air in between you and that outside environment. And that's what these layers are building towards dead air space. Down preserves that by value of its structure, but if it gets wet, it locks up and it doesn't have any real good insulative value and it takes a very long time to dry. My big warning is that unless you are buying one of the highest end down jackets, if it says it's waterproof, do not trust it because a lot of the material, while it may be waterproof, they're sewing through that material to create those pockets of, uh, of down so it doesn't all settle. So if you look at this jacket, you can see this stitching right here. So that stitching is designed to keep that synthetic material in these segments. Down jackets work the same way. The, the biggest issue is that each one of those stitching holes is an opportunity for water to penetrate over time. And if there's anything we know about New England, it's that snow can turn to rain very quickly. And that slow, drizzly rain can work its way through into your jacket. So you wanna be very, very careful with that. That's why we use shell layers. When I'm hiking, I'm not wearing my puffy jacket. It's in my backpack for when I stop. This is gonna to be too warm for me to be using it in any kind of active sense. Uh, for instance, Two days ago, I was leading a cross-country skiing trip out in the Berkshires. I was not wearing that puffy jacket. 
and even though we were going very slowly on this cross country trip, I was only wearing one base layer, one mid layer in a very, very light shell up top. That's all I was wearing um, for that because otherwise I'd get too warm. And if you start to sweat, it's going to become a risk for uh, your, your cold weather uh, exposure. If you start to sweat, what's happening is you're gonna be facing what's called evaporative heat loss. Now, it's a pretty fundamental concept for a lot of us because when we sweat, we cool off in the summer that evaporation of the sweat off of our skin cools us off. That's one of our evolutionary mechanisms for dealing with excessive heat. When we're dealing with it in the cold though, we start running the risk of dropping our core temperature and that leads to hypothermia. Uh, if we start having our core temperature dip below 90 degrees, so normally we're about 97, 98. If it dips below 90, we're in severe hypothermia. And even as low as uh, 93 degrees, if your core temp dips to 93, you can start exhibiting signs of lethargy, confusion, apathy. These are all big risks. And the risk that we face isn't necessarily of the hypothermia being the thing that causes a long-term injury. It's our confused state leading to a fall or becoming lost, something like that. That's for us the bigger risk statistically that we're worried about. After our puffy layers, we start getting into shells. Now this is something uh, like rain pants or ski pants. When I'm hiking, I wear rain pants, not ski pants because ski pants are generally gonna be too warm. Uh, you know, we're hiking in the teens or you know, even as low as the single digits, sometimes a little below zero. But even then ski pants are a single layer of very, very, very warm material. Uh, and for me, they're, they're too warm. For other people who run colder, they might be a good idea, but in my experience, they're too hot. Whereas rain pants are very thin, they're a single layer of not really terribly insulative material. I'm wearing them to keep the wind and moisture out. Because if I'm exposed to wind, um, that, ex that also magnifies my cold weather injury risk. So if it were, 20 degrees outside and the wind was blowing at about 40 miles an hour, which right now it is, that is the equivalent of having your skin exposed to still air that is about negative 20 degrees. So when we start dipping into those factors, we need to cover up all of our skin to be able to protect it from that, uh, that heat loss. For that, we're wearing shells and shells are things like uh, rain jackets, rain pants like this. This is an Arcteryx raincoat. You don't need to get an Arcteryx raincoat. They're like $400. They're a little excessive. I got a very good deal. Uh, I don't want you to think that I'm motivating all of you to spend $4,000 on clothes so you can go outside and play. Uh, other companies make similar stuff, uh, including REI, L. Bean, Patagonia, Mammoth, all sorts of companies make similar stuff. And you don't necessarily need Gore-Tex if you're not trying to stop moisture. If you're just trying to stop the wind, you can wear something like this. This is from Black Diamond. This is the hoodie that we got from REI as instructors, and it is exceptionally thin. You might actually be able to see, you can see how thin it is. You can see the light coming through it. All this is designed to do is go over my mid layers and prevent that wind from taking heat away from me. Any questions on shell layers? All right. Last stops are hands and head. Uh, for your hands, I do advise that you grab some glove liners. Again, these are nice and cheap, just like the, uh, the sock liners. These are from Outdoor Research. These are pretty good. These are Merino. And as you can see, they're really, they're really nice and thin. Yes, you can wear a raincoat over a puffy. That is a very advisable thing to do. I do that a lot. Um, I, I'll go into that in a, a little bit more detail in a minute because I can talk to you about layering when the environment's gonna change very rapidly, which does happen in New England and uh, when you're bouncing between altitudes. So these 
are great for a couple of reasons. One, you're getting a nice barrier, an, an extra layer of air between you and the cold. And when you're wearing very lightweight gloves for say uh, fat tire biking or cross country skiing, you might want lighter gloves that might just protect your hands from uh, the cold a little bit or more so from uh, blisters and coming into contact with you know, surfaces. So these are just bicycle gloves that I'm wearing that have almost no insulated value. But now with that glove liner underneath, these are great for cross country skiing or mountain biking because my hands will stay warmer than they otherwise would. And I'm not putting on a big gauntlet like glove, something like this, which would become way too hot, way too fast in those more dynamic situations. The other advantage to a glove liner is when I am wearing these big heavy gloves, I can't manipulate fine, my fine motor control is terrible. Um, you know, for our REI classes, we have a lot of paperwork that we have to fill out. I cannot write with my hand like this, or I can't, you know, open a zipper or pound in a tent stake or anything like that. So what I do is I can pop it off. And now my hand is not coming into direct contact with a cold surface. So manipulating very cold metal uh, or anything like that will suck the heat right out of your hand. With this, I don't have to worry about that as much. This makes me a lot more comfortable in manipulating objects and it gives me that fine motor control. And these have the, uh, the touch screen thumb and four fingers so you can, at least in theory, still use your cell phone. I found that most of those only work about half the time, especially when it's cold. Mittens are always gonna be warmer than gloves. If you look here, each one of my fingers in it is in its own separate compartment. This keeps my fingers isolated. They're gonna be a lot colder. If you run cold, if you have something like rain odds, you're gonna want mittens. If you're going to high altitude, grab some mittens. And you can grab very thin over mittens that could go over a smaller glove that'll give you a lot more protection as well. Two areas that often get overlooked for maintaining uh, full heat retention are the head, which is responsible for about 25% of the human body's consumption of blood, and the neck, because the neck is supplying the brain with that blood. These are very vascular areas that you can't really see on me because I'm covered in beard. This is why we wear things like buffs and scarves. And we have high necks, high collars on a lot of our jackets and everything. We want to protect that area. If we're losing a lot of heat right here, it's going to get put us at a higher risk of hypothermia. So this is a, an area we want to protect. Things like a scarf, a buff, high collars, those are going to work. And of course, wear a hat. Now, there are a couple of different options. You can wear an acrylic beanie like this. They get, for me, a little uncomfortable after a while. Uh, I get itchy. You can get polar tech ones, synthetic ones, wool. Uh, a beanie is always a good bet. Or of course, you could you know make a dramatic fashion statement and wear a nice rabbit fur hat. That's up to you. Some people don't like those. I think they make me look uh, a little bit more like an outdoor instructor sometimes. But that's most of what I want to cover today. Uh, I'll touch on. Go ahead. There's a question about your beard and how quickly your beard freezes. <laughs> it's actually kind of funny. I can tell how cold I can tell how cold it is based on the answer to that question. How fast it freezes really tells me how cold it is. So at 32 degrees, I barely notice it. But when we start dipping below 20, right here starts to tighten up. And when I can feel the whole thing freeze, it gets a little tighter. And then I know that it's quite cold, which is a nice little barometer for me because I don't often get all that cold. Uh, and it's nice to have something tell me that, oh, other people might be really cold, especially because usually if I'm outside, I'm not alone. I'm usually uh, either instructing or you know, leading a group of friends in some sort of hike. And it's, it's nice to have a little you know, safety mechanism that can be like, oh, other people might be cold, time to be careful. But it'll, it'll ice up. The snow 
builds up and you can see one other mechanism of heat loss, uh, respiration heat loss. So when we breathe out, we can see that steam, that's heat escaping. Uh, when I breathe out, some of that moisture freezes before it can escape. So I end up with a, an icy mustache. Uh, and in weather like this, when I go out to snow blow, I'll come back in looking like a Yeti. Any other questions, serious or otherwise? All right, so with masks, masks are a challenge because of that respiration heat loss, because we expel so much moisture when we breathe, there's not, there's not a lot can be done. So synthetic masks, I know Outdoor Research makes one with a replaceable liner. Um, they've held up pretty well and they're uh, further away from the face. We use those in some of our programming. Uh, surgical masks are just gonna get really wet. Any, any kind of mask that's right up against the skin is gonna get very wet. If you look at cold weather, uh, like baklavas and stuff stuff like that, I'm sorry, balaclavas. Baklava is a delicious dessert. Uh, balaclavas will usually have uh, a permeated membrane. So they have a ventilation area built in so that moisture can escape without clinging to the material. That is always a, uh, an issue. And unfortunately, the only things can be done about it are either making the membrane more breathable, as in the case of most balaclavas, that is not really ideal for any place that still has a mask mandated factor if you're bouncing from inside to outside with a great deal of frequency. Um, with those kind of systems in place, unfortunately, if you want a mask that's going to protect you from a biological threat, it is going to end up not being very breathable and it's going to end up getting very wet. Uh, my advice would be to carry extras and let them dry out. That's, that's really the, uh, the only option there. One other thing I wanna touch on is staying hydrated. Very, very important. Um, what can happen is if you don't hydrate properly, you can actually, your body can actually start to shunt blood away from your skin and extremities exacerbating the risk of cold weather injuries. So stay hydrated and stay, uh, stay fed as well. Your body needs calories to burn in order to protect you. Any other questions? I know we've got uh, only a couple more minutes before. Oh, wait, we have lunch after this. I forgot about that. So only a couple more minutes before, uh, before lunch. Yeah, Andrew, I just wanna just jump in for a second. Um, last year, um, right after the session, I did a, huge um investment for my all of my i've you know three kids and bought all of them um some of the gear and i gotta say also this year for sort of the the youngest ones the resale is like incredible so you know just as a if you're going to make the investment and you especially for your kids um i i would say it's worth it because then you know you can pass it along to someone else or you know also the resale value on the marketplace is pretty high so don't don't fear the investment i guess is what i wanted to add Keep yeah, your kids, kids warm. Kids, kids do uh, outgrow, you know, very quickly. So I, I understand that that being a uh, concern. Yeah, I don't have any other questions. I saw a couple pop up um, for the oh, yeah. events question. Uh, REI events you can find at rei.com/events. Uh, so that's a full listing of all of our outdoor programs. We're doing snowshoeing, cross country skiing, snow permitting, obviously, winter hikes, survival navigation. And if you're interested in trivia nights, where I very occasionally uh, ask questions about things like merino wool, because it's kind of interesting how it was treated in Spain for a long time, uh, you can find those at my website or on the Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash McCahey Standard Trivia. Thanks, Andrew. There's another question about resale. I know that I personally do a lot of resale on the Facebook marketplace is one, but I know that you want to just, um, REI also does some resale, correct? Yeah. I'm going to be uh, very honest with everybody here. Sell it yourself. <laughs> if you're trying to resell anything, you're always better off cutting out that middleman because that middleman will uh, take a pound when you don't have it to give. Uh, Facebook Marketplace is great. 
uh, I find it really, really nice because it takes some of that anonymity out of the, uh, the interaction. Uh, so you can see that the person is indeed a real person. It, they're not, it, it makes it a little bit safer uh, in my experience than things like Craigslist. Um, and I know that is a, a concern for a lot of people these days. So Facebook Marketplace is really good. I know uh, there's a couple up other companies. Um, of course, I can't for, I can't remember yeah, what they there's are. There's Poshmark and Mercari. I mean, I don't want to, but yeah, there's a lot. If you go on to online uh, upsell, resale, it's also like, let's be honest, it's a great way to recycle clothes that you're not wearing anymore. So if you're not using them, might as well pass them along to someone else. Exactly. Or of course, donate as well. Um, there's a question about alpaca socks being sold at, um, at REI. Is that something that you can pick up there? I honestly don't know. I don't work in the stores. Uh, I'm exclusively an, exclusively an outdoor instructor, but if it is available, it would be on the website. Great. Um, also want to give a plug for those um, who are um, wanting to venture outdoors, um, the Boston Harbor Islands National State Park is going to be hosting a trip to Paddock Island um, later next, at the end of next month, um, February 26th. Uh, you can take a ferry out to Paddock and um, there'll be a day of exploration. If there's snow, bring your snowshoes or cross country skis. It's a great place to explore snow. If it's not, which also happens, um, also just really special to be out there. It will be the first public um, trip out to um, out to uh, Paddock since uh, before the pandemic at the Winter uh, Wander uh, a few years ago. Um, and also Tam will be there as well. So um, hope uh, to see some of you out there. And there are any other last last call for questions. If not. I want to give a huge thank you um, for a wonderful presentation, Andrew. Thanks for keeping it interactive. I really appreciate um, all these great tips. And um, I have to say, my 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 winter uh, sock investment has really paid off. It actually makes it tolerable to be outside. So they make um, a big difference. Really do. Um, so thank you again for attending. Um, I also wanted to. Um, add that we are going to be taking a little a lunch break now from one to two, um, but our webinar is going to remain open. So if you want to stay and discuss anything in the chat box or, or add your questions there, um, it, it's fine to stay, interact with one another on the chat. That's great. Um, but otherwise, we're going to take a quick uh, one hour break and uh, we'll hope you'll join us for our next presentation, which is called Hibernate or Migrate, Bats of Massachusetts and their winter behavior. And that's at 2 p.m. Um, and for the full schedule of events, please visit our Eventbrite description. Um, and uh, we hope you have a great day. I would say um, stay safe. Um, and for anyone who loses power, I just wanna let you know, we are recording everything. So, um, and we'll post it up on the, on the Facebook um, and park website at a later point so that if you need to, if you lose anything, it will be right there. All right. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your break. Stay warm. Thanks, Andrew. Hopefully we'll see you outside soon. Thanks for having me. Thank you.